Ever since Jurassic Park, we've dreamed of recreating dinosaurs. They ruled the Earth for over 100 million years. Who wouldn't want to see them up close? But the science behind this fantasy seemed impossible. Until now. Today, new science is blending paleontology and genetics. A new breed of dino hunter is using remarkable genetic advances to explore the DNA of dinosaurs' descendants, the birds. Their expeditions into DNA are discovering ancient traits that once belonged to dinosaurs. I think that all birds are able to grow teeth. We're getting these dinosaurian-like tails starting to develop inside a modern bird. Not just teeth and tails, but even scales and hands. They're reviving the possibility of creating a living, breathing dinosaur, but in a different way than you ever imagined. We're getting closer. The, the technology is racing. I don't think there are really any barriers other than philosophical. Will science ever be able to bring back dinosaurs? Recreating dinosaurs might not be a smart idea, but in the future, will it ever be possible? To carry it out, we would need a source of dinosaur DNA. Surprisingly, today there are hints that we may be able to find it. The first attempt begins in 1992, when Raul Cano and his former student Hendrik Poinar conceive a strange experiment. They'll try to recover DNA from an insect almost as old as the dinosaurs. It's trapped in amber, a sticky tree sap that hardened into a transparent stone. Speculation about the possibility had inspired the Jurassic Park story. Kano decides to actually try it. This is a bee, a stingless bee, probably 25, 30 million years old. This is an ant. You can see the head. They had the thorax and the abdomen. This is a fly. You can see the tissue is very well preserved. Pictures like this created the possibility of having Jurassic Park because uh, it's possible that some of these organisms may have taken a blood meal from a dinosaur and preserved the DNA of the dinosaur. The idea seems clever but impossible, until Kano decides to search for ancient DNA with a new technique that can detect the tiniest DNA fragments. They begin by sterilizing the amber. Then, they add freezing liquid nitrogen. Well, now it's, uh, the liquid nitrogen is, is boiling over, and the amber is going to get real cold and it's going to crack. And finally, you'll be able to have access to the interior, and then you can collect the samples. Next, Kano grinds up the tissue and adds chemicals that make millions of copies of the tiniest DNA fragments, allowing them to be detected on a gel. After many trials, amazingly, they succeed in detecting a small sequence of DNA from a 40 million year old bee. Soon after, scientists at the American Museum of Natural History recovered DNA from an ancient termite. Suddenly, the impossible seems possible. Although the chances are slim and the fragments would be small, it appears that we may actually be able to find dinosaur DNA. But then, the bottom falls out. Over the next few years, all attempts to replicate the experiments fail. And the extreme sensitivity of the DNA test leads to suspicion that the recovered tiny fragments were contaminants. One has to be extremely careful to make sure that you do not introduce DNA into the sample. Uh, from the air or from your lips or from your hair or your clothing, you're always running the risk of uh, amplifying the wrong thing. 
scientists have now abandoned the search for DNA preserved in amber. But since then, researchers have recovered longer stretches of ancient DNA from a 40,000-year-old mammoth and 45,000-year-old Neanderthal bones. So why not from dinosaurs? The problem is that DNA is weak. As dinosaurs fossilize, bacteria, water, changes in temperature, and cosmic rays all break it down. Today, many scientists doubt that DNA can survive for more than a few million years. It appears that recreating dinosaurs will never be possible. Then, surprisingly, hopes of finding dinosaur DNA unexpectedly revive. This time, it may come directly from a dinosaur. Famed paleontologist Jack Horner was an advisor to the Jurassic Park films. He discovered the first evidence that dinosaurs cared for their young. And he has pioneered the use of groundbreaking new techniques like this laser mapping tool. Now, he sparks another breakthrough. In 2003, in the Montana Badlands, Horner's team is excavating a remarkably well-preserved T-Rex skeleton. But the site is so remote, they can only carry it out by helicopter. And the thigh bone is too heavy. They have to break it in two. People just don't normally go around and break their bones open. And even for us, this was a time we just broke it because it was the only way to get it out. Horner gives a piece of the bone to his former student, paleontologist Mary Schweitzer. She examines it and immediately notices an unusual bone structure inside. It resembles a distinctive type of bone found only in pregnant birds. Puzzled, she asks her assistant, Jennifer Whitmire, to do something rarely done before. They place it in an acid solution to dissolve away some of the minerals on the surface. Six hours later, Whitmire looks again. She ran into the room, she says, you are not gonna believe this. When she picked up a small piece to stop the reaction by putting it in water, it stretched and it sproined and it moved all over the place. So we knew we had something pretty unusual. It appears to be soft tissue. It's unimaginable to find soft tissue. It was just assumed that everything had been fossilized and therefore there wouldn't be soft tissue. When they look at neighboring parts of the bone, they're even more surprised. Out popped the blood vessels and they were pretty incredible. And I said, I don't believe it, that's not possible. We need to do it again and again. It's one of those just goosebump-inducing scientific moments, that's all I can say. And I, they don't really happen very often. Blood vessels should not exist in fossilized bone. Many scientists believe organic molecules can't last more than 100,000 years. Yet Schweitzer's bone is 68 million years old. I think the presence of soft tissues and cells indicates there's a process going on that we didn't have a clue about. So I think it means that we have to kind of rethink the whole chemical process of making a bone turn into a fossil. Now, Schweitzer and Horner begin searching for more soft tissue. Do bones on museum shelves around the world contain dinosaur tissue with protein and perhaps even DNA? 